Okay, so number one, we're trying to make a box out of a square piece of cardboard. Let me show you a picture of the situation. Here's a square piece of cardboard that measures 12 by 12 feet. Then what we're trying to do is we're trying to cut out a square of the same side from each corner of this cardboard. So like a little X by X, X by X, X by X, same thing over here. So basically, if you do that, like I said, um, it's really hard to show you, but if you, well, this is not a square, this is a rectangle, but anyway, like if you do cut out a square of the same side from like this, I'm trying to show you a 3D model of this. Then what you do is you fold. So I took, I, I cut out a square from a piece of paper. You fold the edges of the cardboard. And it makes what's called an open box. Here. So I'm trying to show it to you. So that's what I did. I made a open box from a piece of paper that I cut a little square from each of the corners and I folded up the edges. Okay, so, and then I see that Angela is here, so let me mark her here. And I'm again, I'm trying to record all of this so that you can watch it again. and skip through all the all the bad parts. Okay, so here you go. So picture that, so that makes this box like I just showed you. So the question is, write a function to represent the volume of the box in terms of its height. So I know you can't see it here, but this box that I made, the height of the box is represented by what I cut off. So X would be the height of your box. The length and the width of the box would be represented by the original 12 units minus X minus X, because I took off X from each corner. So this right here would be the, like the length, this right here would be the width of the box. And then like I said, the height would be X. So basically, let me just give you the equation for the volume of the box. This box would have a volume of X times 12 minus 2X, because like I said, we cut off X from each corner, and then times 12 minus 2X again, because it was just a square. So you can write it like that, or you can write it as 12 minus 2X squared times that X. So that's the equation to represent the volume of the box. So one more time, the volume is X times 12 minus 2x squared. Um, now what you'll need is, like I said, a calculator. So after this, you just we're going to graph this equation and answer all these questions based uh, using the calculator. So calculator. You need to go to a graph. So get yourself a calculator or um, I'll upload the directions on how to get this calculator software on your computer. But basically, I just want to graph x times 12 minus 2x Oops. times 12 minus 2x again. I'll just call it square. It cannot accept it. But your square is the x. Oh. No, I'm trying to. Yeah, but that's what's wrong. There you go. All right, so what I did was I went to the calculator, I got a graph, and then my graph, I typed in x times 12 minus 2x squared. Once you graph that, um, 
we need to have a good window. So I can't, I need to zoom out a little bit. Let me change this Y maximum to like 100. No, 500. Oh, way too much. 200. That's better. So uh, I changed the Y maximum to 200 so that I can see a better window, a better view of this graph. So this is my polynomial equation. And what we'll need to do is we'll need to sketch it on the paper. We'll need to find a reasonable domain, a range. We'll have to find the maximum volume and answer the questions. So let's, for starters, let's go ahead and find this maximum here. Let's go to the local maximum by doing menu analyze graph. So under menu, there's option number six, analyze graph. And then you want to go to the maximum, number three. And then it's going to ask you, where's the lower bound? So that means just take your little cursor anywhere to the left of the maximum. So here, upper bound, just take your little cursor anywhere to the right of the maximum. And this will find you the maximum. So now we know that the maximum is at x equals 2, y equals 128. We'll represent those in a minute according to the situation. The next thing that we will also need is for the, do for the domain, we'll need to find these zeros down here. So one of the zeros is 0, 0, because if x is 0, the graph is 0. But here's how you find the zeros. is under menu, analyze graph again. Menu, analyze graph. And then the first option, zero. So same thing. It wants the lower bound. So let me try to find this one over here. Just take a cursor to the left of that x-intercept and then move it to the right of that x-intercept. And it should find you the x-intercept of 6, comma 0. The other one, like I told you, is 0, but we can just find it anyway. So OK, so there it is. And I think that's all we need for now. Let's try to answer some of these questions and put them on paper. So letter B, let's graph the function in your paper and label the axes. So please keep working. Okay, so here's the axes. On the X axis, we're gonna put X, which is actually the height of the box. On the y-axis, um, instead of calling it y-axis, let's call that the volume. Seth, what's up? So, if you're you're saying that the maximum is at two one twenty eight, why is it not um, like at twelve or something like that? Like because the graph just keeps going up after that point. So why is it not at twelve, which is like higher than two hundred? Oh, I'm about to show you why. So um, it, it has to do with the reasonable domain. So when we graph this function, here's how we're going to graph it. I know there was a 0, 0 here, and there was a so a 6, a 0. And then, OK, so basically, OK, here's how you need to graph the function. We are only going to graph the reasonable domain for the situation which in this case, the reasonable domain will only go from x equals 0 because the box, I threw away the box, because the box could have a height of 0, so you have a, a, a flat piece of paper. And then the maximum height of this box is only going to be 6 because remember that the, the piece of paper was only 12 feet high or 12 feet long. And if you do 12 minus 2 times 6, that's going to give you, you're going to end up with like just no, bo uh, no box at all. So the height of the box can't be anything more than six. It, it can't even be six because then you really don't have a box at all. So when you graph your picture, you only want to graph the reasonable graph from zero to six. So after six, you either don't graph that part or just graph it with a dashed line because it is not possible for you to make a box that has a height of more than six if your piece of paper is only 12 feet long and you're going to subtract x minus x. So after 6, the box is not possible, so dash it. 
before zero, obviously the box can't have a negative value. So all of these are also um, not possible. Plus you can't have a negative volume anyway. So um, the only correct maximum would be the one I found, which was two comma 128. So this is the only reasonable box that we can make with the maximum volume. So if I do cut off like two and two and then make my little box again, that would be the maximum volume possible. Um, so I hope that helped. Jerry, question. Uh, why is the equation like x twelve times the 12 minus 2x? It's like, I understand that 12 minus 2x, but like not the x in front. So. Oh, because, so this box, where's the box? So the box was, the paper was 12 units by 12 units. So I guess you understand that I took 12 and I cut off x and then I cut off x again. So that's how I got 12 minus 2x. But then what I did was I folded up the paper to make a box. So pretend like I taped it together. So this is an open top box. And the height of, like I can put stuff in here. Like I could put candy here and it will stay in here. But anyway, the height of this box is represented by what I cut off, which was X. So that's why the volume of this box is going to be x times 12 minus 2x and then times 12 minus 2x. So that's where that x is, is the height of the box. Okay, thank you very much. It looks like that. So now, I guess to keep going with the domain in the reasonable situation, the domain, like I was trying to tell you, x could only be somewhere between 0 and 6 if you want to have an actual box. It can't be zero, so put a parenthesis, because if you don't cut off anything from each side, then you still have a flat piece of paper. And then it can't be six, because if you cut off six and six, then you just can't fold it up. So the reasonable domain is only from zero to six. So because of that, then your reasonable range is gonna go from zero to only 128. So you can go to positive infinity because it's just not reasonable for the situation. And again, at zero, go ahead and put a little parenthesis because you can't really have a box that has a volume of zero. That would just be like, an, like a flat piece of paper. That's not a box. You can't hold candy in there. But the, the, uh, the volume of 128, that is possible. So if I do make a box that has a, a height of two, then it will have a volume of 128 whatever cubic feet. So I can't hold that much volume. So put 128 with a bracket. And that would be your re reasonable situation for this scenario. And that would help you answer letter D. What is the greatest volume possible for the box? Well, the 128 feet. I think it was, yeah, cubic feet. And that's what you would answer. And now the last question for this is um, letter E. Using your equation here, find the dimensions of all of the boxes that would have a volume of 12. So again, what we want to do is on the calculator, we're going to graph like a, a volume of 12. So like a y equals 12. We're going to graph that and we're going to find the dimensions of a box that would give you a volume of 12. And I think there's actually more than one answer. So let's do it by going to back to the calculator, hit tab so that you can put y equals 12 on the second function. So tab, y equals 12. Press enter. Work with me. There you go. And if you notice, your graph does intersect the line y equals 12 twice. So let's try to find those intersections. Okay. So you can find those intersections under menu, analyze graph again. So let's try to find this first one here. Menu, analyze graph number four intersection. Um, Let's try to find the first intersection that's really close to zero. So lower bound, take the little cursor to the left of the intersection, 
and then put it to the right of the intersection. And there is one answer. If the if x equals to 0 0.0857, then the volume would be 12. But then there's another answer. So find the other answer over here. Menu, analyze graph, intersection. Oh. Intersection, left. Okay, so I also found if x is 5.24, so if the height of the box is 5.24, then the volume will also be zero. And, and then if you notice, there's a, not, there's a third intersection over here, but we're not going to find that one because that one is not possible, is not within the reasonable domain. That's like six point something. And you like, like I told you, the height of the box can't be more than six. So we're just going to ignore that one. So when we write down our answers... Still working. So when we write down your answers, remember the first intersection was 0 0.086. Let's go ahead and round. Just I just put three decimals there. And our second intersection was 5.244. I think. Yeah, that looks right. All right. So now, that's not the final answer to the question. You still want to answer the question that says, what are the dimensions of the box? So this first dimension is going to, the first answer is going to give us the first set of dimensions. So here it goes. If the height is the 0 0.086, so that's x, then the width would be, remember that the width is 12 minus 2x. So I just need to do on the calculator, I need to do 12 minus 2 times this x value to get the width. So since you have a calculator, just 12 minus 3 times 11.828. So that would be my width of the box, 11.828. So one more time, all I did was I did 12 minus 2 times this x value that I got, 0 0.086. And then because the box was a, a square piece of cardboard, that means that the length is going to be the same as the width. So 11.828. And the whole thing is in feet. So that's the first set of dimensions for my first box that gives you a volume of 12. And then, however, there's another set of dimensions for a second box that still gives you a volume of 12, but this time your height is 5.244. So this time I'm just gonna write it as 5.244 by, okay, so we need to find the length and the width. So one more time, just do 12 minus two times, this time do 5.244. So calculator, 12 minus two times. So about 1.4. 512. 1.512 by 1.512. And I think these you will see like as multiple choice. So just select the, the dimensions that give you a, a volume of 12. So that's one of the dimensions for the box. And that's another possible set of dimensions for a second box. And that is how you do a polynomial inequality using the calculator. I'll pause for questions. Okay, so number two, let's go ahead and try it. Well, this is still working. All right, number two. Uh, it's another polynomial situation. This time it's just going to ask you, it says, find four rational numbers such that the product of the second, third, and fourth number is negative 63. The second number is two more than the first. The third number is five less than twice the second. And the fourth number is six less than the first. Okay, so that's a lot of words. Let's just start with like defining our variables. So I'm gonna start with let x equal the first number. Hashtag. Okay, so x equals the first number. Now we need to define the second number in terms of x. So the second number is 2 more than the first. So 2 plus 
x. That's my second number. And now we need to define the third number. The third number is 5 less than, so 5 less than twice the second. Twice this thing. So 5 less than twice the second, that would give me my third number. And finally, the fourth number is 6 less than the first. So 6 less than the first. Alrighty, so now I have um, I have all my numbers defined in terms of x, and now I just need to write the equation, and I need to write the equation for the product. So we're going to be multiplying just the second, third, and fourth numbers only. So I need to multiply the second. Where's the second? Right here. X plus two times the third, which is two times x plus two minus five. You can simplify this if you want. Times the fourth. So that product of the second, third, and fourth number should equal to negative 63. Negative 63. Once you have your equation, the rest is gonna be done on the calculator. So now that I have my product of second, third, and fourth, I'm gonna graph this on the calculator. Here's how you'll graph it. Um, under F1, you're gonna graph these three numbers multiply together. And then under F2, we'll graph the uh, y equals negative 63 and we'll find our intersections. So calculator, go back to the graph, clear this mess. I forgot how to clear the mess, doc B. Okay, if you press doc B, it clears everything. So again, back to the calculator. I wanna type in the X plus two times the two X two times X plus two minus a five times the X minus six. Okay, there it is. So this is the, um, <clears throat> that's just the product of the three numbers. Uh, again, we need to zoom out out of this thing so we can see the whole graph. So let's change this Y maximum to like 100. Oh, way too much. 50. Okay, and then we'll also need the Y minimum. So let's do negative 100. Okay, that's pretty, that's pretty good. You just need to find a good window to where you can see everything. One way to change the window is what I do. Like I just go and like double click on the number, double click on it, and you can change it. You could also change your window under menu, window zoom. Yeah, you can try to zoom out or you can try to change the, the window settings here to what you want them. So right now I'm using an X minimum of negative 10, an X maximum of positive 10, and then I switched my Y minimum to negative 100, and I switched my Y max to 50. So that's my window. Okay, now we wanna know when is that product equal to negative 63. So like I said, let's put negative 63 under F2. For that, you need to press tab, and now put negative 63, enter. Okay, so it looks like there are three intersections, so let's find all three intersections, and then we can answer the question. So the way you find the intersection is under menu, analyze, graph. Intersection. Let's start with the negative one over here. Okay, so if x equals negative three, then the product is negative 63. If x equals 2.5, then the product is also negative 63. And then there's one more. Okay, 
if x equals 5, then the product is also negative 63. So I'm going to write down those x values, negative 3, 2.5, and 5. Okay, so x equals negative 3, x equals 2.5, x equals 5. Those were the intersections, but that's not your answer to the question. The question wants you to find the set of four rational numbers that were described above. So that means that if your first intersection, which is x equals negative 3, that means that that's just your first number. So negative 3 is your first number. Now you need to find your second number by doing x plus 2. So negative 3 plus 2, which is negative 1. Now you need to find your third number by, I'm going to simplify this thing. This should just be 2x minus 1. Yeah, 2x minus 1. So now I need to find my third number by doing 2x minus 1. So I need to do 2 times negative 3 minus 1 plus negative 7. And then I could do it one last time. Uh, my last number was x minus 6. So negative 3 minus 6. Negative 9. This would be one set of answers. So this is a set of four rational numbers whose product of the second, third, and fourth would multiply to a negative 63, which makes sense because negative 1 times negative 7 times negative 9 is negative 63. Okay, now you need to find the other two sets. So very quickly do it again. If x is 2.5, okay, I don't have time, so I'm just going to copy the answer key. But if you go with it, if the first number is 2.5, then the second number is 4.5. The third number is 4. The fourth number is negative 3.5. And again, last set of answers. If x is 5, so if my first number is 5, my second number will be 7. My third number would be 9. And my fourth number would be negative 1. I could pause for questions, but we don't have time. Plus, you don't have questions, so let's just move on. That's how you would do um, the second example. Let me try to do one more, and then I'll finish the video by myself, and I'll post the whole video in Schoology for you to watch later. So the last one we'll do is example three. Again, using your calculator, it wants you to solve using the calculator. Find each real zero. Find the local maximums and the local minimums. Approximate your answers to the thousands. Express your answer in interval notation and or set notation when needed. Okay, so that's going to be easy. So these were just going to be uh, graphing the function and finding the zeros and local max and mins. So that one's not that bad. Um, let's do graph. <clears throat> Let's just do example B because I don't know real time for, for A and B. Let's do letter B. So let's go ahead and graph x to the fourth minus 6x cubed plus 3x squared plus 10x plus 3. So again, go to your graph. Clear this mess with the doc B. And type in letter B. So x to the fourth minus 6x. Three. That looks good. That looks really good. Um, I do need to zoom in or zoom out a little bit because I can't see the local maximums or the local minimums. So let me change this Y max to like 100. Wait, way too much. Decent. And then let's change the um, the low, uh, the Y min. Negative 50. Okay, that's good enough. Actually. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. All right. So uh, with your window, we need to find all the zeros. The function 
is x to the fourth. So that means there's four zeros. And you can see there's a zero there for sure. There's another one here. And then because I zoomed out too much, there are two zeros right there. So we're going to find all four under menu, analyze graph, menu, analyze graph, zero. Let me just start with the easy ones. That's one of the zeros right there, 4.96, menu, analyze graph, zero. 2.155. And then like I told you, there's two zeros right there. So maybe I need to go back and zoom in a little bit. Oh, let me change the this. Oh, no, that made it worse. Eh. Okay, that's fine. I'm still doing okay. All right, so there's two zeros there. Find them. Menu, analyze graph. Okay, so I found one of them at negative 0.3766, and then there's another one. The number of zeros should equal to your exponent, so x to the fourth means there's four. Okay, they were really close together, but I found them all. So you can just list them. The zeros are at x equals negative 0.744. So I guess maybe just start writing. Zeros. Negative 0.744. The next zero, negative 0.377. Negative 0.377. Oh, thank you. The next zero, you can list them in any order. The next zero, 2.155. And the last one is 4.966. So I just wrote them down. And you can just write them down in any order you want. So use the calculator to find the zeros with menu analyze graph. And then last thing I need to show you, or I want to show you, and then I'll finish the rest of these by myself is how to find what's called the local max and the local mins. So local max, local min. It's possible to have multiple local maxes and multiple local minimums. So let me show you this one. Okay. Okay, this whole thing is a big mess here. Okay. So the function that that we grab is a cortic that opens up, up. So technically there really is no maximum. The maximum is infinity, like positive infinity. But this little vertex hump here that I see here uh, that I'm pointing at, this is considered a local maximum. So like, I guess this is the local, this is the maximum in between your zeros. So I can find this local maximum by just doing the menu analyze graph. So let's do that. Menu, analyze graph, maximum. And then I just want to find the maximum of the little of the little vertex here. Okay. So if you see it there, it says one point one zero seven and eleven point one zero eight. So that's you would write your local max um, as a point, as an order pair. So where it says local maximum, I'm gonna write. 1.108 comma 11.109. So this graph only has one local maximum and it was at the 1.108 comma 11.109. That's called a local maximum. And then same thing with the local minimums. Um, for sure, this negative vertex over here on your graph, that's a minimum, a local minimum within the zeros. And then also the other one, the little baby one over here, um, that was the that was a negative vertex too there, so that's also a minimum. So let's find the easy one first. Yeah. Analyze graph, minimum. Okay. 3.96 comma negative 37.0. 37, that's going to be one local minimum. And then let's find this one. Menu, analyze graph. 
minimum. Okay. So the other one is at negative 0.569 comma negative 0.508. So write those down. Let me write them down. Um, negative 0.5. Seven zero, comma negative point five zero nine, and three point nine six two comma negative thirty seven point zero three eight. Okay, let me show you. So I basically just wrote them down as order pairs, and there was two local minimums, and. That's how you do that. So let me pause the video here and then I will finish it by myself. Okay, guys, so here's the rest of today's examples. Make sure you try example 3A, same thing by graphing this on the calculator and finding the zeros, the local max and the local mins. So I'm just gonna give you the answers. You should try it on your own, but the zeros were Negative 2.214, and 1.675. The local max was at, make sure you list the local max and mins as order pairs. So negative 1.155, comma, 5.079, and then the local min was 1.155 comma negative 1.079. All right, so practice finding those. And the last thing I need to show you is the same thing using the calculator, how to solve inequalities on the calculator. So we're gonna solve them by graphing because we can try uh, letter A here. Let's take this polynomial and put it in the calculator and figure out when it is less than zero. So it just means when is it below the x-axis. So take your calculators. Uh, let's clear the memory, doc B. Okay, so example four, letter A, x squared times minus three times x plus three. Okay. We can zoom out a little bit in the, oops, way too much. Uh, but anyway, so this is a quartic that opens up, up. So it is less than zero, so it is below the x-axis from, I guess, this zero here of, I'm guessing, negative three, all the way up to this positive three. But just be careful because at zero comma zero, it is on the x-axis, so we have to uh, exclude that answer. First, let's just, conf yeah, I mean, this has got to be three. You can still confirm uh, with the analyzed graph, but you can tell from the factors that this is three com negative three comma zero. This one would be zero comma zero. And then the last one would be positive three comma zero. Again, so the graph is less than zero below the x-axis from negative three to zero, not including negative three or zero. And then again, from zero to three, not including the zero and the three. So to write this in interval notation, we can just put negative three to zero, and then union zero to three. And same thing in set notation, you can put um, x is in between negative three and zero, and then union x is between zero and three. So that's how you use the calculator to solve an inequality. I'll do the same thing for letter B. Um, you still wanna set the inequality to zero so that you can see when is it below the x-axis or above the x-axis. So let's rewrite this one as, um, let me rewrite it up here. Three x cubed minus x squared minus 18 x plus six. And then we're also, we're again looking for less than or equal to this time, zero. 
So let's just graph that on the calculator. Minus x squared minus 18x. Okay. I mean, that's a pretty good window. You can see it. It's a cubic, a positive cubic that's down up, so you can see everything here. So again, we want to know when is it less than or equal to zero. So it's going to be less than or equal to zero below the x-axis. So this area is below the x-axis, and then this other whole interval area here is also below the x-axis. So let's just find all those zeros here using your menu analyze graph. So before x equals negative 2.449, the graph is below the x-axis. And then in between x equals 0.3333 comma x equals 2.449, the graph is also below the x-axis. So you just need to write that in interval or set notation. And it's less than or equal to zero, so we can include the zeros in our answer. So when I write it, I'm going to say interval notation. Negative infinity to negative 2.449 with the bracket union... Bracket 0.333, comma, to 2.449. All brackets because it's less than or equal to zero. And then you can redo it with set notation. X such that X is less than or equal to negative 2.449. Union X is in between, greater than or equal to 0.333 and 2.4. Nine. And I guess that's the way you'll try the last one. So same thing, just graph it. And this time, um, again, let's set it to zero first. So let me just write it as x squared times x squared plus 4. Let's do minus 4x cubed greater than zero. So this time we want to know when is it uh, greater than zero, so above the x-axis. Where make sure you put a little times symbol because if not, sometimes it doesn't work. Times it's square four minus four cubed. I would just type it in exactly like that. You could simplify, but it's just type it exactly like that. Okay. So this is, again, a cortic that opens up, up. So it looks like that. And then it wants to know when is it greater than zero. So it looks like the graph is um, either on the x-axis or above it. So it's always greater than or equal to zero. But um, we only want when it's greater than zero. So we just need to exclude these zeros here, which I'm guessing they're like at 0, 0 and 2, 0. Let's just confirm. So one of the zeros is 0, 0, and that one looks like 2. Okay, so the graph is always greater than or equal to 0, but it is only greater than 0 um, pretty much everywhere except when x equals 0 and when x equals 2. So one way to write that, um, I guess let's do interval notation. We would say from negative infinity to 0 with a parentheses, union 0 to 2, union 2 to infinity, all with parentheses. So that's that's how you can write it in interval notation. And for set, uh, for set notation, we can just put x such that x doesn't equal to 0 and x doesn't equal to 2. So basically, it just says every x value except for 0 and 2. And that is how you do a how you solve inequalities by graphing using the calculator. So make sure you practice that on the worksheet. 
And the last thing you need to know from today's lesson is example five. We've done this before, something called finite differences, which means we're going to take a look at the difference in the y values to determine if the table is linear, quadratic, cubic, or quartic. So um, let's start with that. And then after that, we'll use the calculator to do a regression. So first, let's find the changes in the y values here. So you can think of it from like, you can go from negative 1 to negative 7. Or I always do it backwards. I always go the change from negative 1, uh, sorry, the change from negative 7 up to a negative 1 as a positive 6. The change from a negative 3 down to a negative 7, that's a minus 4. The change of 5 down to a negative 3, that's a minus 8. The change of 11 down to a 5, it's a minus 6. And the change of a 9 up to an 11 is a positive 2. So if these were all the same change, then it would have been a linear graph. But it is not linear because they were not the same change. So then what you do is you do the next difference on these differences. So you look at the change from, um, I always like to go this way. So from negative 4 to 6, the change is a positive 10. From negative 8 up to a negative 4, the change is a positive 4. From negative 6 to negative 8, that one went down. From negative 6 down to negative 8 is a minus 2. And from 2 down to a negative 6 is a minus 8. If these differences would have been the same the second time that we did them, it would have been quadratic. But they're not, so then it's not quadratic. So let's try it again. Um, the change from 4 to 10 is 6. The change from negative 2 up to 4 is also 6. And the change from negative 8 up to a negative 2 is also a positive 6. So notice how here the third time we did the differences, they were all the same. So this is uh, a cubic. This is cubic. If they weren't the same, then you would do it one more time to see if it's a quartic. But we're done here. This is a cubic. So now that we know that this is a cubic, we're going to use the calculator to do something called a cubic regression. Um, so get your calculators ready. And this time you're going to have, you're going to need to go to a spreadsheet. So from the home menu, you click on this Excel looking app. And, um, Let's type in our data. You need to type in your X values and then your Y values. Okay, so let's type them. Negative three. Negative two. Zero. And the Y values were seven. Negative three. Make sure you label each column X and Y. So just go all the way to the top here. These were the Y values and these were the X values. You need to label them so that it works right. Okay, so once you type in your data and you've labeled the X values X, you've labeled the Y values Y, then you just need to go find a cubic regression because it was a cubic. So the way you do that is under menu, menu stats. So menu, statistics, the very first one that says stat calculations. And you need to find the cubic regression. So again, it was menu, statistics, stat calculations, cubic regression. Your X list, remember I called it X. The Y list, I called it Y. You can save the regression into F1, that's fine. Frequency list, leave it as one. Everything else, just skip, skip, and go press OK. So this is going to give you your answer that you need. So your equation will be what it says here, ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d. So here's a, here's b, here's c, and here's d. So you just need to write them down as, a, as an equation. So it was y equals negative x cubed negative x squared, positive 
8x positive 5. And that's how you use finite differences to determine um, the polynomial, whether it's linear, quadratic, cubic, or quartic, and then you just do the appropriate regression. And now you just got to go practice.